Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee. Or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films... Head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to the Next Real. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. Oh, this is interesting. This is <laughs> this will judge our relative popularity in our site analytics. Um, in terms of people who are looking at our individual profile pages, JJ's first, Tommy Handsome is second. <laughs> <laughs> and then there are nice. a whole lot of movies. This is all over the last month. Then Steve, uh, and then Chad, <laughs> and then you. I'm not even in the running. That's Nobody so cares. Funny.
Nobody cares. Oh, I'm about after us. that. I'm way after that. I'm between get ready for your 48 frames per second future and struggling with the Hobbit in 48 frames per second. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. That's hilarious. <laughs> Analytics are great. <laughs> Oh my goodness! Such weirdness. Oh, but that's bizarre. that's like looking on iTunes to see our popular shows. And yeah, it's I know. Like, I haven't looked recently, but it's like Bull Durham was always like the top. <laughs> Bull Durham it's is like, the most popular show we've ever done. What is up with that? So I, I, in terms of people visiting our our site, our website at thenextreel dot com, the most popular show we've ever done is Cujo. Uh, really, the, the second most popular, due to recency, I bet, is The Martian, and you know, obviously, popularity, sure. you know, current popularity. Right, right, right. Uh, but uh, I think Cujo is that's pretty funny. That's very funny. And I wonder how much it it uh, varies from you know country to country. Like if we look at iTunes in you know different countries, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I wonder what's yeah. what's the most popular. Um, because right now on iTunes, Ant Man is up there in popularity. The Exorcist, uh, The Shining. Well, it's Halloween. I don't think I can tell. Like when I'm looking up the foreign iTunes. Oh, stuff, you don't think it has that popularity mark? It doesn't show that. It it only gives me name, description, released price, and then I can yeah. view it in iTunes. But it doesn't give the ranking. Oh, okay, list. you actually have to be logged in in the app. I'll bet. Yeah, and it has to be obviously in that. Yeah. Yeah, points. Bull Durham uh, is still up there, but it has been superseded by mm. others since. I would love to see like a a uh, a trend line of our, our show's lengths over the last four years. Yeah, because I think they've the gotten <laughs> I think they've gotten longer winded. I think they have, but <laughs> I think that you do a good job of curbing my. <laughs> My verbosity. And then cutting all the times I have to tell you to shut up. And so then it looks like you're actually brief. <laughs> yes. <right. laughs> That's not true. Yeah. Um, Thanks. Uh, do you, uh, let's see, I was not able to do my part. I'm done with analytics. Are you done with analytics? I'm done with analytics. Right. I was not able to do my part this week. I did not see Sicario. I did not see The Walk. And I still love The Martian. So uh, I assume, I know you saw Sicario. Yes. And I assume you saw The Walk. I didn't. Oh, good. I, good. I really wanted to. I just have not had a chance. So a little bummed about that. I really wanted to check out the uh, 3D IMAX I, uh, version of that. The uh, uh, Elvis Mitchell on The Treatment did an interview with Robert Zemeckis and uh, what's his name? Tom, ba- Tom, Tom Bombadil. Uh, we're going to call him <laughs> Tom Bombadil, the president of Sony. Um, and they uh, for about a half hour, it was a great conversation and one of the things i love so much about it is he said you know our we went into this film uh looking to do um a a, an old-fashioned uh pg adventure movie like that's it's a pg film and i then the way they talk about it with such reverence to um you know films of that ilk from when we were growing up Mm mm-hmm it was really a great conversation. It was really uh, like they they just really love the audience that they're catering to. They want to make, you know, they want to make these audiences from eight to eighty really sit up in their seats and have a great time and throw up a little bit. <laughs> I don't think that was part of the pitch. Probably not part of the pitch, but <laughs> I'd like to imagine Robert Zemeckis in the back of the auditorium, just kind of rubbing his hands together and giggling. <laughs> <laughs> There's another one. <laughs> so we haven't seen The Walk yet, but we're going to. Tell me about Sicario, but don't tell me. Don't spoil it. Uh, I won't, but um, it's it was just not at all what I was expecting. Um, but it really it really hit me more than I was expecting it would. And um, stuck with me. It's just something that I kind of haven't shaken yet. It's just a lot of interesting things to think about. Done in a really interesting way. It's, it's, is it like like what do you what do you mean? Like is a it's a crime thing. It's a police thing. It's like a like is it just it's crime just, and I, humanity? Is I think it, it was just kind of the tone. Like I wasn't really like the tone struck me as um, just a, a much different tone. Like I don't know. Maybe the trailer made it feel kind of like it was going to be kind of a border crime thriller. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, and, that's uh, what it did for me. Yeah, and it, it definitely is, but it didn't have kind of like the uh, intense kind of uh, thriller um, pacing that I was expecting. It ended up being much more... Um, and I don't want to make it, you know, kind of sound like I'm diminishing it, but it sounded, it, it had more of a uh, kind of this dark, pensive uh, vibe that kind of was looking a little deeper at some of the causes of things. And just the the, the way that this these characters evolved and, and believed in things and everything, it was just... I don't know. There's a lot more character stuff going on in it that I was expecting in, and it really, um, it really got to me. I, and and it was also, uh, supposedly it was set in like your neighborhood. I hear pretty much though. They filmed it in uh, Toronto. (laughs) (laughs) Not quite. Uh, Just, uh, they were one state over. They were filming it in uh, New Mexico, I believe. And, uh, yeah, New Mexico, the Albuquerque area just doesn't quite look like Chandler and Tucson and stuff. So, I mean, you know, they're filming at Luke Air Force Base, so to speak, which is like a 10 minute drive from my house. And it looked nothing like Luke Air Force Base. Yeah. So it's, you know, that's just one of those frustrating things living in a state where the, the, uh, uh, they've gotten rid of a film office and, you know, it's, it, there's no tax incentives. And so nobody wants to come work in Arizona anymore. It's frustrating. Uh, okay, so uh, I said I still love The Martian. I stand by that, and I only bring it up uh, not to perseverate on or to you know gang up on you again, as we all did last <laughs> weekend, but to urge people to go download last week's... Uh, we, we did a uh, film board. If you haven't seen The Martian, if you're interested in hearing our opinions on it, you should go back and listen to last week's uh, episode. We had the gang of thugs around and had a great conversation about The Martian and talked about the book and talked about... Uh, um, you know, all sorts of good things about the film. And that leads us to our next film board, which is coming up. Uh, we're doing Spectre, which leads me to this news item, which comes as a surprise, I think, to nobody, uh, that Daniel Craig came out today and said, hey, I'm really, really done. Uh, and I'm officially, <laughs> I'm officially putting a fork in it. And his final words <laughs> was, were pretty good. Uh, he said, look, I don't give a... F- Good luck to them. <laughs> That's right. He seems like such a cheery fellow. He really does. It, and so this is what he was asked. Right now, the blue-eyed Bond, who appears next in Spectre, can't fathom doing another 007 film. Now, he says, I'd rather break this glass and slash my wrists. No, no, not at the moment. Not at all. That's fine. I'm over it at the moment. We're done. All I want to do is move on. Craig went on to say that if he were to decide to go ahead with another Bond movie, that... It would be only for the money. Not that that's a terrible reason to do things, but a, not that one. Not it doesn't one. sound overly grateful or, or appreciative of the opportunity that it's afforded his career. Or right? Anything. Doesn't that hit you sideways a little bit? <laughs> yeah. Because he's, oh, he's definitely my favorite Bond uh, and uh, so far at this point. You know, like right now today, he's definitely my favorite Bond. I really love Daniel Craig as Bond. And so to hear him be less than... Uh, you know, gracious. <laughs> I, it's something. It's something in the words. Maybe it's the subtext behind. I'd like to break this glass and slash my wrists. <laughs> I think he's. He, there's a subtle, if hidden, message in those words that that we should all take to heart. I wonder. I wonder how he really feels. Maybe he just wants to just like do nothing but sit on his couch and swill beers and and eat Cheetos. Yeah, and he's right. you know this this. He's done Bond being physique. Fit. Yeah, maybe that's it. <laughs> that's right. I'm gonna, that's what I'm going to go with. Don't, don't we all know how that feels? <laughs> oh, too well. <laughs> uh, do you have any news? I don't have any news. Nobody no. died. <laughs> of course, of course, some, somebody sort of out. Thing. Somebody died. Somebody did die. <laughs> I'm just not sure who they are. All right. Well, maybe next week. <laughs> maybe next week. Oh, we've got to uh, give a shout out to a new fan. Mark Walker, that's right, who uh, definitely shared the love with us on uh, all the platforms this week. So uh, it's great hearing from you, Mark, and certainly people should check out his blog at markedmovies.org. And thanks for throwing out a few suggestions, uh, a few little ideas for some movies to talk about down the road. Blade Runner 
Cuckoo's Nest, Jackie Brown, Mean Streets, Thin Red Line. Lots of uh, great things for us to talk about one of these days, maybe. So uh, thanks for sharing with us, Mark. Why, uh, why haven't we done any of those films yet? I'm sure it's your fault. Probably is. <laughs> I mean, it feels like at least some of those should have hit our list by now. Uh, I think they are great suggestions, and I, I look forward to seeing them. And, and so Mark uh, wrote to us in a number of ways. We won't read the the uh, the private messages that he sent us, but deepest thanks uh, for that, and thanks for working your way through the um, you know through the the litany of uh, films we have talked about so far. Absolutely. So thanks everybody for the shout outs on Twitter and Facebook. We really appreciate it. And uh, once again, welcome uh, Mark Walker from Scotland. We love those Scots. Mm. Let's tell the people where we're from. Where are we from? This is the next reel on rashpixel.fm, everybody. I'm Pete Wright, and that there is Andy Nelson. Hello! And we spoil movies. Tonight on the show, the first in our Horrible Children Halloween Spectacular series with Mervyn Leroy's 1956, The Bad Seed. Before we get into that, you should learn more about us at thenextreel.com. Subscribe to the show on iTunes or follow us on Twitter and Facebook at The Next Reel. And if you're the sort of person who knows the proper exchange rate for a basket of kisses, you should probably head right over to instagram.com slash thenextreel and play our Instagram hashtag pony prize hashtag guess the movie challenge. And with that, let's tune in to that gardener from Scotland planting his own bad seeds, Stephen Smart. Hey guys, continuing on from last week's theme of love, this week's movie was The Duke of Burgundy, directed and written by British director Peter Strickland and starring Swedish actress Sidsie Babbitt Knudsen. This week's winner was good friend of the show at Glassid. So congrats Gustav, you are entered once again into the Pony Prize hat. As always, a new challenge starts Friday. So thanks guys, and see you later. Andy, yes, it's yes. time. Let's do trailers. I, uh, you know, a few weeks ago we did the, the Stanford pr- uh, Prison Experiment trailer, right? Yes, right. That's not out yet, is it? I hope I not. I haven't it, seen it. Uh, it came out uh, limited. I mean, okay. It was All a right. limited release. I'll I haven't seen it, but I'm very know. excited to see it. And th- as soon as I saw the trailer I'm doing tonight, I immediately thought of that one. I feel like we should do a series. <laughs> this is this <laughs> Bad Scientist called. Series. Exactly, the Bad Scientist <laughs> series. Uh, this is called Experimenter, and it's coming out next weekend. Uh, it is the story of Stanley Milgram's uh, exper- experiment that was so lovingly uh, chronicled in the film, originally in the film, Ghostbusters. Um, <laughs> right? That's, uh, yes. Uh, this, was the, this was the real experiment where uh, he put, uh, there were three people at play. There, were, there, were, uh, there was the, um, the, uh, uh, the doctor, uh, the teacher, and the learner. And, and the learner and the doctor were, uh, you know, they were the part of the experiment. The learner would sit in another room, and the doctor would sit in the room with the teacher and would tell the teacher, okay, you have to—here's here's a little shock. You'd give him a little shock, and the, so the teacher would get a little buzz so they'd know how serious the, the shock was at, a, at, at its lowest level. From that point forward, uh, they would ask a series of questions to the learner in the other room, and the teacher would then uh, have to give the, uh, the learner a shock— in 15 volt increments. Every time they got an answer wrong, they'd add 15 volts to it and and get another shock. And by the end of it, the uh you know the 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 shock goes up to like 400 volts or something like that. Uh, it, I I electricity is not my my jam, but <laughs> the the upshot of this is he the, he was doing this experiment on the power of obedience. And when you are just told by a, a figure in authority, even not direct authority over you, but perceived authority, as in the case of a doctor to you know anyone else, uh, when somebody tells you to do something, are you likely or how likely are you to do it? In the first round of these experiments, uh, Milgram got over sixty percent of respondents to give the four hundred volt shock to people in the room that they could when they could not see them. Uh, and so it, it, it of course, they weren't actually giving shocks to people. There was, there was no shock. It was somebody in the other room who was screaming uh, in pain every time the light went on, but there was no actual shock, no actual pain. It was an experiment on the person giving the shock. 
uh, and it ended up being a, a, a fascinating study. So that's the background. If you are not a, uh, if you have not become a fan of Stanley Milgram after that, I don't know what what would make you do it. The fake beard. <laughs> He's a fascinating guy. He is. He was. He's fascinating. So this movie documents that uh, that experiment uh, beginning in 1961, and uh, it is uh, written and directed by Michael Almereda, uh, and we have talked about him somewhat recently uh, because of the oft name changing film uh, released last year, Cymbeline, uh, which I never saw because the name changed too many times and I got tired of it. <laughs> This one, I think, looks much more interesting to me even than that. Uh, Taryn Manning, Winona Ryder, Peter Skarsgård, Anton Yelchin, Kellen Lutz, John Leguizamo, Laurie Singer, Anthony Edwards, Dr. Green, Dennis Haysbert, Jim Gaffigan. He's the guy, who gets, he's the guy who gets zapped all the time. He's very funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, this has a fantastic cast full of really interesting people, uh, uh, and it's, it, it talks about a guy who is really worth talking about and worth learning about, because whether or not we think his experiments were ethical, uh, right, or good, man, did we learn a lot about the human condition thanks to his work. So I am really interested in doing that. And can you see my undergraduate uh, psych um, almost major? It's coming through. It's coming out. I'm (laughs) fascinated by these characters, so... It looks really interesting. The cast um, really piques my curiosity. I love that uh, Jim Gaffigan is in it, of all people. That just is such a surprise to see him in there. But it was uh, made me very excited. Um, and uh, just, I mean, the rest of the cast, it's it's great. I mean, it's, it's nice seeing Laurie Singer in something again, Vondi Curtis Hall. All of it looks great. And it is a very interesting story and one that, uh, I yeah, I hadn't even heard that this was coming out. So I'm very curious about seeing this one. Yeah, it looks good. And and like I said, it comes out next weekend, October 16th. So, um, you know, by the time you hear this, it's probably already going to be on on VOD. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> so, so plan ahead. Plan ahead. Yeah, go get it. That's it. What's yours? Well, my, mine is a an interesting little horror western that is coming out. I hadn't heard of this at all, um, but... Uh, Kurt Russell and his great big bushy beard uh, certainly excites me. I love seeing him in the uh, the Hateful Eight trailer, and this is another opportunity to see him in this Western time period. This is uh, he must have grown this beard and said, you know, I may as well put it to use and be in a couple jobs <laughs> while while I've got it. And uh, this is this horror Western with uh, Kurt Russell, Patrick Wilson, uh, Matthew Fox. It's nice to see him in uh, something like this. David Arquette, Rick- Richard Jenkins. And uh, then, like, Sean Young, Lily Simmons, and Catherine Morris. It's a great cast of people in this interesting-looking... I I can't quite place my finger on exactly what it is, but it looks like... I mean, it is a horror western. It's a group of men um, who set out to rescue some captives. It looks like one of the captives is... I don't know if it's uh, Patrick Wilson's wife or family member... Um, but they set out to rescue the, these captives from some cannibalistic cave dwellers. And it looks like a very interesting kind of a Western period piece blended with kind of a... I, I can't quite get a vibe on who these people are. Are they like, you know, some cannibalistic Native Americans? Are they uh, kind of kind of half-human sort of people like uh, in The, the Descent? descent. Right, that's kind of, I mean, seeing Sid Haig in it just for some reason makes me think it's going kind of more that horror route because he certainly is somebody who's uh, been in those sorts of films. So I don't know. I have a hard time pinning my finger on it and I, I don't know what to expect, but it looks really cool and I just love the Western vibe that's going on all through it. S. Craig uh, Zoller directed it and uh, this is his second film uh, after Asylum Blackout and he's uh, uh, which he wrote this one is his directorial debut so it's one of those interesting little films that uh, you know somehow this guy it's his uh, directorial debut and here he is he's got this incredible cast so I'm really curious why all these guys signed up for it and uh, I'm assuming that it must be a great script so kind of on board with this one and this one opens a week after yours October 23rd so talk about a couple of films that are really just coming right around the pike here yeah uh, this one is I I don't know if this one's my jam 
Uh, so clearly, electricity is not my jam. I'm not sure if this movie is my jam. It mm. it it was one of those that was that was like so. <laughs> it was. I gotta be warmed up to the violence a little bit. <laughs> I'm I'm There's... okay with some violence. I can I can handle it, but I gotta be warm. And this movie or this trailer is cut in such a way where there will be like threatening Western guy in a beard, brandishing knife. Cut to cutting someone's throat. Cut to immediately <laughs> uh, already bleached, digested skull rolling on the ground. And that happens multiple times in this film. The number of cuts from life to skull makes you think that, like, this is a film about digestion. <laughs> it's just, it's just, it, it's, uh, so, I don't know, it looks, uh, it's, it's energetic. It looks it's energetic. very energetic. And, and uh, I love the, uh, just kind of this brutality in it. I mean, Matthew Fox blowing that guy away. I mean, there's just a lot of interesting things going on. It looks like something I would enjoy. It so. really does. It really, <laughs> really does. Uh, uh, okay. Well, Andy. Pete. Why can't you wash off blood? Mm, she might get kind of lonesome when that soldier boy hair's gone. I wish she were mine. Every time I look at her, I wish I had just such a little girl. This has been a terrible tragedy for Mrs. Daigle if she's lost her only child. That know it all, Monica Breed, love. I don't think nobody knows anything but her. He has the mind of an eight-year-old, but he's managed to produce a family, so I came him on. Give me those shoes back. Oh, no, I got them shoes hid with. Nobody but me can find them. Better give me those shoes, they're mine. Give them back to me. I believe you did it. What do you give me if I give you a basket of kisses? I'll give you a basket of hugs. I'll miss your hugs. <laughs> well, I'm not letting a slice of grief. Really knows when she's told if you don't mind me being presumptuous. I had a long talk with that guard since I saw you last. And that was a long, interesting conversation. He said he saw Rhoda on the pier just before Claude was found among the piling. She owes some more, right? Did you have anything? I don't care how small it was. Did you have anything to do with the way Claude got drowned? What makes you ask that, Mother? Now look me in the eye and tell me the truth, because I must know. No, Mother, I didn't. You're not going back to the Fern School next year. They don't want you anymore. Okay. I'm going to call Miss Fern and have her come over here. I think I lied to her. You did lie to her. But not to you, Mother, not to you. You know something? Miss Fern dyes her hair. And Rhoda's a sweet, perfectly sound little is girl. She father, is she? Run, Daddy! Next to Daddy, you lift me up best. Why do you look at me? I just want to see your face. The Bad Seed, 1956. Oh, this wasn't the 1985 TV movie? It's not funny. That's still not funny. <laughs> All these years, uh, not funny. I think it's funny. Andy, uh... Do you, know, do you know that Eli Roth is in talks to make a new Bad Seed? I'm not crazy about that. He's an interesting choice, though. But this is what he had to say. The original was a great psychological thriller, and we are going to bastardize and exploit it, ramping up the body counts and killings. This is going to be scary, bloody fun, and we're going to create the next horror icon, a la Freddy, Jason, and Chucky. She's this cute, cunning, adorable kid who loves to kill, but also loves in sync. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I think, somewhere in there is where I have a problem with it. <laughs> I can't put my finger on it. Maybe I should break this glass and slip my wrists. <laughs> Something in there is not right. No, we are talking about the 1956 The Bad Seed, the uh, the one and only film adaptation of the play and book. Uh, it was it was an adaptation of uh, the book turned into a play, and then I think this is a rarity. Taking six. The core cast of the Broadway run, which was a hit in a year when, what, Peter Pan hit Broadway? The Bad Seed was a hit. They took all six of the core cast and put them in the film, which 
uh, ended up uh, being weirdly uh, uh, successful. <laughs> you had not seen The Bad Seed. I had not. I really, really want to hear what you thought of this. It was fun. I had a good time watching this. I I mean, it wasn't, you know, the one of my favorites or anything, but Patty McCormick was just awesome as Rhoda. I just absolutely loved her. I loved the over the top um feel running through this whole thing. It, it's they really did not uh, kind of tone it down from the stage version to the screen version. It's very heightened. Everything is big and grand. Uh, You know, Rhoda is definitely that way. Her mother, um, Christine, played by Nancy Kelly, is definitely that way. And uh, just everything is really heightened. And it was very fun to watch. It's not, uh, like I said, it's not my favorite or anything, but it's a really fun story. It's uh, it's kind of dated now, definitely like with all the psychological exposition that that rattles on in there. But uh, but I, I had a good time. I am so glad to hear that you had a good time with this movie. I'm really relieved uh, <laughs> because I love it. I love this movie, and I I feel like I shouldn't. I feel kind of dirty. Uh, for loving it, but I have an absolute blast watching it. It doesn't bother me that it's over the top. It doesn't bother me that you have all of these, um, like it is, it's shot almost as it was, you know, staged, um, which is, which is interesting. Uh, you know, I think there were only a couple of sequences. I think the conversations between Rhoda and Leroy uh, were moved from inside the house to outside in the, in the arbor. Uh, for the film, and we get to see the the basement, uh, but generally it is staged it staged like a play in the in the yeah. in the film. And I'm not bothered by that. I'm not bothered that you have the actors speaking longingly into the middle distance, not talking to one another. I'm not bothered by how that feels. It it feels like a melodrama, and it's fantastic. Uh, I think that the relationship between Nancy Kelly and Patty McCormack is just priceless. I think they got that so right these two and and they had played already by the time they started doing the film uh they had played um you know they'd done 333 shows together on broadway and and that's that's a lot of work together particularly for for uh mccormick who at the time is you know a young girl you know learning and and investing in the material and then so you know by the time in an interview with uh uh, with McCormick uh, that's available up on YouTube, there's a great conversation where she says, you know, what you see in the film is the end. You know, that's that's what, you know, two years of study and learning about this character and, and really investing in, in being a, a complete diabolical killer as a 10-year-old looks like. Uh, and, and I thought that was, that was a really neat, uh, way to look at it, that it's, this is kind of the pinnacle of the telling of this story. Uh, after a lot of years of practice, I thought it was great. I think Nancy Kelly is is uh, such a grandiose and and big. Uh, she's grandiose and big. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, she's uh, she's bigger than life, and I think that one of um, uh, Patty McCormick's great strengths in this film, as the as the young murderess, is uh, to be able to kind of match her energy and tempo and it that as a result makes it feel not only like they belong on stage together but that they really are related mother and daughter i mean it feels very familial to me so i loved it i i love everything about it and uh this time now that i've watched it with children it actually made me think even more deeply about it which i didn't expect and eileen lockhart or i uh, lockhart eileen heckert um as mrs daigle was also just so good. Yes. The um the, I mean there was so much in that performance as this as this every time we see her drunk mother of this dead this dead boy who we find out Rhoda actually had killed. Um she plays that part so well. Like it was it was again so big and over the top, but it worked so well and that tension between her character and um, both Christine and Rhoda uh, and, and anyone else in the room really it, it is it's just so tangible and aside from the brilliant relationship between Rhoda and Christine because I think you're right it totally feels like like mother daughter like they play that relationship so well but then also this um, 
this uh, Mrs. Daigle is is just connected to them in such an interesting way. I, I loved that. Yeah, I thought so too. And you know the the standoffishness between uh, Rhoda and Hortense. You know when Hortense throws her arms out, she's come here and give Auntie Hortense a kiss. You know, I mean that like the way uh, McCormick's body uh, just sort of winced at that. I thought was just so perfectly natural. Now at that that I know what how kids wince when they're having trouble dealing with adults. I thought it looked really good uh, and and uh, really believable. Um, and and Evelyn Varden, the way that she kind of reacted and grabbed her yes. to save her and stuff, or to kind of pull her away to go, oh, we've got to go shopping now or whatever she said. You know, she was great as that kind of that that busybody who's into everybody's stuff. Well, <laughs> I, I have to say, and, and then we're going to talk just a little bit about the story, but I have to say, after watching this movie again, I think it is possible that Evelyn Varden's Monica Breedlove is the most diabolically bad character uh, evil character in the show in the movie. She <laughs> she is the the ultimate enabler. She spoils both the kid, uh, and so we she becomes. You just get this feeling that's going to be a social disaster, even if she wasn't a diabolical murderess. Uh, and she enables all the other psychobabble uh, throughout the entire thing, which which kind of leads Nancy Kelly's uh, you know Christine Penmark uh, down the road of of. Uh, her own kind of undoing. And so I just thought that was, uh, I think she's just uh, the centerpiece of evil in this film. Uh, So the story is, is, and and we've talked about her before on the night of the hunter and she is kind of the same, the same thing. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, I, okay. So the story is for those who haven't seen it, go see it. First of all, it's it, you'll have a blast. Don't think too hard about it. Uh, you'll know it was a play before now, and you can actually go YouTube uh, and and find a couple of really good versions of the play in full on YouTube, so you can see how it is actually staged. And I I had a great time clicking around uh, through a couple of different versions of the Bad Seed that um, that were staged that are that are really fun. And th- you know, thank God for YouTube. What, what a treat. Um, so the play is thus we we or the the story is thus we we have Rhoda who believes she should have won the Master Penmanship Award. Uh, but instead, uh, the little Daigle boy uh, won, and Rhoda didn't agree with this, and so the Daigle boy disappeared. And the first act is all about the mother kind of coming to terms with the fact that something happened to the Daigle boy that Rhoda, her daughter, you know, knew about. And I find that such a wonderful display of just unraveling writing the exchange between nancy kelly and uh mrs uh what's her name uh the from the school claudia fern i think yeah mrs fern mrs right. fern right uh played by joan croydon joan croydon uh is subtle and nuanced and uh absolutely uh mean spirited at the same time and i just love it the way she uses social grace to couch absolute rudeness and fear. Uh, I thought that was a great example of of just wonderful screenwriting. Am I alone? No, I think it is. And I think it is a nice um, look at how those sorts of uh, relationships were back in this period, back in the 50s. Um, it was, so, there was so much more of that um, decorum that people would have in their conversation even as they were trying to maybe accuse something or hint at something and that and there's just all that subtext under the conversation between Christine and Mrs. Fern that is just so great because you can totally feel everything that's going on between the two of them as they have this conversation as they're trying to kind of keep that especially Christine trying to keep that kind of 50s housewife um display that she's putting on yes and it works so well. And Mrs. Fern, likewise, is putting on that same sort of display. Not she's the she represents education, and she's kind of that that uh, that old maid who who is just responsible for the kids. And she but also to, class, right? I and, mean, she right. also represents class, right? And she and she needs to kind of have that that presentation, even though she's trying to talk about 
uh, Rhoda to Christine, she is very much coming about it in this very uh, roundabout way because she can't just come out and say things. She has to be um, very uh, just drop little hints and and little and it seems like this is kind of this uh, mentality of kind of this fifties way of of uh, having to present yourself led to so much of that cattiness, the way that people would talk, you know, that kind of all that kind of that subtext under what they're saying. Yeah, this is this is the earliest. Uh, uh, this is an early breed of political correctness. <laughs> right. right. This is it morphed. But but this is this is what it looks like. And I think it is just really wonderfully written. It is it's like a little circus of words. And I, I think it's really fantastic until they pull back the curtain. And eventually we hear this. So you've already made up your mind. And, and we should just say the what we're saying here. You know, is she is Rhoda not invited back? No, she is not. Uh, and and then it's over and and it's just a it's a beautiful sequence. Um, from there, it starts to come out that that Rhoda, it turns out, has a bit of a history. Uh, she has uh, apparently um, she was involved in an accident with an older woman in their old boarding house, and and the old older woman had slipped down some stairs, and it just so happened that Rhoda got a, a, a little statue, uh, like a snow globe kind of a thing, out of that particular deal. Um, and, uh, and then we see now that there is more of a connection between Rhoda and the, the boy. Um, it, it's, it's when I think we meet, uh, Leroy, uh, that things start to, Leroy Jessup, things start to kind of move more quickly. Well, we meet him pretty early on cause he squirts her shoes. Oh, you're the, right. You're right. Water. Yeah. And so we, but, and boy, I tell you, I mean. You know, you go into a movie or a play or whatever it is called The Bad Seed. And I, I feel like you have a good sense as to what you're, what's coming your way. Now, I, I, don't, I can't speak for the audience back in the 50s when they went to see the play initially or read the book or watch this movie if they had any idea. But, it, you know, it seems like it's pretty clear to me that Rhoda is the one who's uh, – there's really something evil going on with this girl. So – you know, once this tension between her and Leroy erupts right at the beginning when he sprays her shoes with water, quote unquote, accidentally, you know that Leroy's going to die. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Leroy going to die. <laughs> oh, Leroy. Yeah, he doesn't end up, uh, he doesn't end up making it through to the end. But he is a fantastic uh, uh, actor. This is played by Henry Jones. I don't believe we've talked about him. Yes, yes, we have. He was in Butch Casting the Sundance Kid. That's right. Uh, That's this right. Uh, Henry Jones. So uh, he's a fantastic actor and such a uh, apparently quite a uh, a gentleman too. He, uh, according again to uh, uh, Patty, said that uh, she said he was the only one in the entire uh, run of the play and the film uh, that was ever upset that she wasn't going to school. Right. Uh, and uh, um, she said it was only now that I realized what a gentleman he is to actually be so considerate of me. Uh, and then he was just an annoying old man. <laughs> <laughs> so he fit the part well. He totally I guess. fit the part right. It was a. It, it's a. He he was a fantastic guy. Apparently very buttoned up, and this was outside of his character by a long shot. Um, he uh, to play this uh, uh, rundown handyman. Uh, and and comes off as a completely sinister character. I mean, you can tell, even though we know we we know Rhoda is the bad seed in this whole thing. Uh, they they go to some lengths to to make a poor Leroy, um, you know, look like a a uh, unfriendly character. Well, he yeah, he's a bit of a bad seed himself. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's a uh, man. Two hundred six acting credits. I mean, tons of TV work. This guy. He was in Vertigo. He was in uh, the original Three Ten to Yuma. I mean, geez, he was in the the Grifters in uh, nineteen ninety in Arachnophobia and Dick yeah. Tracy. Yeah, yeah. He, I mean, he. Geez, nineteen ninety one, two, three, four, five, six uh, projects in nineteen ninety alone. So yeah, he was a busy guy up until uh, up until he died in nineteen ninety nine. He he was and boy I I did actually I loved him in arachnophobia he was the he was the doc right he put his foot in the slipper uh yes I believe so yeah, yeah. poor guy mm-hmm. poor spider. <laughs> 
Uh, anyway, he was a he was a treat, and I think they had some of the most interesting um, conversations on screen. You know, it got her. Uh, this is uh, Rhoda out of the house, and you know, this is where many of the plot points sort of unfold. We discover that you know it comes out that you um, you know as he's speculating how she must have killed the Daigle boy. Um, uh, did you beat him with that stick? Did you beat him until he fell into the thing? And then, and then it comes out that uh, no, in fact, uh, she beat him with her shoes uh, until he fell down. And then he tried to climb out of the water, and so she had to just keep beating him. <laughs> <laughs> she had to. I think that's one of the most interesting things about this is she plays this character as if she is always right, and there is no like there's no problem with what comes after that because she is justified in her in her belief in her in her rightness. And, well and that's uh, and that's what I think was so interesting about the psychopathy of her um at that young age. The way that it was written originally by uh the author um in that was uh William March and then by Maxwell Anderson the playwright and then into the screenplay here the way that it continued getting adapted, uh, John Lee Mahan did the screenplay, but her, her, just the evolution of her as this young psychopath, it just, it comes across as so realistic. It, it really is like, this is what I've, I've read, like, as a, somebody who has this sort of mentality, this is exactly how they would communicate. This is exactly how they would see these things. It's not, they're not doing it because, oh, I just, because I wanted to kill him. It's just because I was right. And because he had the medal and I wanted it. Yeah. And at that, and that young age, that's how that develops. And it's really frightening. And I think that William March, when he wrote this novel, um, I, I don't know, may have been a little uh, ahead of his time. I think so too. It's it's that overdeveloped sense of justice at too early of an age, you know, uh, and and that is I think what comes off really really well. I think you're absolutely right. You know, it's an it's interesting that it, it, it I don't know um, this this film ended up running afoul of the Hayes Code initially because the the film was about you know, the way the original ended, the play and the the book end. Um, you know, I don't know. Am I getting to that prematurely? No. All right. The way it originally ended, uh, Rhoda uh, is the Christine ends up giving her a bottle of sleeping pills and trying to kill herself and and her daughter at the same time. And uh, Rhoda lives, uh, but mom dies uh, to go on and you know Rhoda lives to kill another day and no one is the wiser. Uh, that anything has happened here, and that that makes the the book truly sinister, right? I mean, that's that is really a sinister way to walk out of of the book. I, I totally get that sense and that feeling. I I'm, I absolutely appreciate what they did there, but the movie does something that I think is even more interesting because of the Hayes Code, and I think it it makes the Hayes Code a real puzzler in this case. <laughs> because they couldn't, and we've talked about this before, according to the Hayes Code, you can't make crime pay. So Rhoda can't get away with killing. She can't get away with it. But then what do you do? So the movie ends with uh, the the same thing happens. Mom tries to, she tries to shoot herself in the head. She, she apparently doesn't do it all the way. Uh, Rhoda survives the drugging. And in the hospital the next day, and she, her dad comes home, and they take her home, Rhoda home, and in the middle of the night, there's a thunderous storm outside, and Rhoda sneaks out of the house down to the dock to try to find the medal, all the way back to the, the, the penmanship, master penmanship medal that we talked about in the very beginning of the film. She's going to find it because that's the thing. That is her, uh, her uh, token that she has wanted all along. All these people have died because she wanted that thing so badly. She believed she was right. And she's struck by lightning and killed on screen. <laughs> they killed a child right. with lightning. The power of God, man. That was bananas. Am I alone there? That was crazy. It's no, it is very crazy. And uh, and they let the mom live too after right. she tried right. to kill her daughter and commit suicide. She ends up living. Now, granted. She has to kind of live with the fact that she tried to kill her daughter and, and that she tried to kill herself and all this sort of stuff. But it, it's a very interesting 
uh, way that the Hayes Code chose to address this. Yes, I guess it's kind of like punishment from the heavens, but at the same time, they are on screen killing a little ten-year-old uh, girl. And and she's so perfect looking, right? I mean, she is. They they nailed the stereotype of the perfect little girl and the perfect dress and the perfect braids and the perfect everything, and they blew her up on a right. dock. They blew her <laughs> to bits. <sighs> Oh, that awesome. was crazy. You gotta love the Hayes Code. I, you know, I love the the idea of the original ending. It's totally dark, and it's just, it's just, I don't know. It's it's the perfect twist to the end of a horror. You know, that's yeah. exactly what we love in our horrors is to have that great little last twist at the end of your denouement that kind of gives you that. Um, that jump that makes you feel unsettled as you walk out of the theater or you know close your book. The fact that the Hayes Code, uh, I, it just always boggles my mind. It's like the book is out there. It has that ending. The play is out there. It's doing really well on Broadway. It has that ending. Oh, but we can't have that same ending in the movie, even though everybody knows what the original ending is. Right. I, it just, it, I, I always question the logic there. But uh, yeah, here it was, a, it was a very interesting direction that they opted but to go. Their logic is always the reverse. Their logic is always, right, those things exist. And if we had authority over them, we would not, they would not exist. Yeah, right. Right? Exactly. Like that's, that's kind of how it goes. Um, okay, so uh, we talked uh, about, uh, did, we, did we talk about, uh, who did we talk about enough? I think did we talk we, about Nancy I, Kelly enough, Patty McCormick? I don't think we talked about them much at all, but all right, uh, Patty well, McCormick. I mean, yeah, she, uh, you know, she's still, you know, still around. She's still acting. She uh, was one of those child actors who got a lot of, uh, of not a lot of child roles, but certainly had a number of roles as a child. And this was kind of the real big breakout for her that um, really kind of helped her uh, take off. Of course, after you play a character like this, it can be a little hard to break that and to shake the, uh, the uh, um, just everything that that character represents. As people talk to you, she says, anytime people come up and talk to her as a kid, they're always like, do you really think like that? Do you really want to go kill somebody? And it's like, oh, people, really? <laughs> makes you wonder. It makes you wonder about people. But... Um, no, she she uh, got really tired of it for a while and didn't ever want to talk about the bad seed because it's like, oh, that thing again. And it took a while for her to finally get past it and to finally be willing to talk about it again and move past uh, to just accept that part of her life and how good it is. And it's a, I think it's a great element of her life that, that she has... Um, uh, has to look back on and... It's just one of those fun roles. I mean, it sounds like, having listened to her talk about it, it sounds like it was never one of those things that was morbid or anything like that. It's just a fun thing for a kid to be doing. And she always looked at it as nothing but a performance. And I think that there is an incredible amount of stuff that she was able to pull from the stage. I know you said this. um, But in particular, I loved the little expressions that she would give with her face, like behind people's backs. There were so many little looks or the way that she would like be smiling and looking all cute. And then as soon as they turned their head or she turned her head, she would kind of give a little sneer or a little kind of roll of her eyes or whatever. She did that so perfectly. I just could not get over how fun it was to just constantly see what uh, what Patty McCormick was going to come up with next. I absolutely agree. Every hug was a treat. <laughs> yes. Every hug. Uh, I thought she was just fantastic, and and to be able to channel that, I mean, she is to to in her own words, she says, you know, this was a gift that I was given to be able to do this because you know, kids, most kids don't know how to do this, and I was never taught how to do this, how to be this person. Uh, and uh, she says that she's this this gave her her career. Um, so I think, as you said, I mean, she, you know, to, to have to kind of move away from it for a little bit to get perspective, uh, you know, I think she's she is appropriately grateful. She's no uh, Daniel Craig. <laughs> and she was nominated for an Oscar for this. I, know. I mean, the, you know, she walked out with a Best Actress in a Supporting Role. Eileen Heckert walked out with a Best Actress in a Supporting Role. And Nancy Kelly walked out with a Best Actress nomination. They all got nominated, plus the uh, Hal Rossin's uh, Black and White Cinematography. So this is one of those things where it's like, this is a 
a little horror film, but it ended up because of the um, I think it's just because of the bigness of this this you know dark story. These people got recognized um, by getting nominated, which I think is fantastic. I love I love hearing that for horror films. I know I do too. I think it's I think it's very exciting. Even though I'm not as the connoisseur of horror films that you are, this was a treat. And I think for me it was such a treat because it was so psychological. There were so many of the. I mean, they we we got to experience so many of the murders, that, and and some we got precariously close to the murder of Leroy when the, she lit him on fire. We saw that from the perspective of of Christine, you know, having to witness the screams, you know, by just hearing them through the window. Uh, we didn't see any of that. We got to witness the murder of the Daigle boy through the sorrow of his mother, a drunk mother and um, and father, played by the great Frank Cady, uh, which <laughs> is a very silent role in this film. Um, <laughs> and, and so, you know, as a result, it ends up being um, sort of a great case of the Jaws syndrome. You know, it's like we see, we see so much horror that we never actually see. Uh, and that makes it really um, so not a good candidate for Eli Roth. <laughs> right, right. No, he's very much in your face. I, I, I would be, it would be sad to see the all of that stuff just right in your face, yeah. turned it into kind of a, a torture porn sort of thing. And I, uh, you know, I, I there's more to this story than making it that. I think so. And now here's I want to talk about just briefly before we talk more about more of the people. My experience watching it with children now. Because this yeah. is where I think the film actually has more weight than I think it did with the first time I saw it pre-kids. For me, one of the things I think that uh, Nancy Kelly just nails is the horror as a parent of knowing that your child has done something wrong, but also knowing that you have an instinct to protect them. And this, in this case, we have the absolute extremes of wrong and protection, uh, and I think she, I, I, you know, as sort of uh, crazy, sort of vaudevillian bigness as it is on screen, uh, in terms of their portrayal of these characters, I still think I was really touched by the way she walks the the character motivation on screen. Yeah, it is. It definitely feels stagey the way that she talks to herself and like, oh, what am I going to do? Should I do this? Should I do that? I love her so much, but I can't believe she did that. You know, that sort of stuff. It's, um, I mean, it's just is so stagey. It's so theatrical. Um, but you're right. She does it so well. And it's that, it's that dilemma that she deals with. Like, how do you handle this thought that that's your kid and she's just learning all this and so of course it's going to be this just this tumult of emotion pulling her in different directions that she's uh really fighting and it's uh she really captures it i think the final sequence that really does it for me is when when uh um is after leroy is killed and she goes into and and uh rhoda comes back and says oh, i don't know you know and she kind of tosses it off and she skips into her piano room and locks the door and starts playing that song god that song and christine blows up and and loses it and starts screaming and pounding on the door tell her to stop that playing that song and then rhoda comes out and she says just don't let me get my hands on her you could tell she's blowing up it's everything she can do not to just like get physical with rhoda uh, now that she knows what's happened and come has is coming to terms with it, but then she she twists, she turns, and um, and and comes to terms with what she has to do. And it it uh, I I think it was just a a beautiful little dance that she did does that that is atypical I think of of the horror genre. Yeah, and even the even her emotions as she's doling out the sleeping pills to Rhoda, um, that was also very. Uh, very touching. There's that. There's a lot of subtext there as she's dealing with the fact that she knows she's killing her daughter. She knows she has to go through this, and um, it, it just breaks her heart. And it's. I, I think that Nancy Kelly was fantastic uh, through all of these scenes. Really. Yeah. Okay. I do too. This was, I think, one of her only feature films too. Nancy Kelly. Uh, yeah, I think she was mostly a, a TV actress. And she was in a lot of... Or this well, was, she, and she actually wasn't in that much stuff. 
Um, yeah. you know, compared to some of the other folks in this in this film. I mean, 55 uh, credits up through about 1977. But yeah, it was a lot of TV. I think all of her films that she were she was in, she was in quite a number of films, but they all were before this. This was yeah. her last her last film. After this, it was only TV. Yeah. And actually, there they were talking about uh, Rosalind Russell and Betty Davis, I think, um, to play this role. But uh, Mervyn Leroy, the director, really wanted uh, the cast from the Broadway stage. And so, I, and, and you know, I think that's great. I think it was great to see these faces. I mean, I'm sure Rosalind Russell or Betty Davis could have pulled it off, but I think there's something nice about having that feel of this family coming from, you know, having done this 300 and some times, really, you know, giving it, giving it an opportunity to nail it for the screen. Yeah, that's an, that's another bit of a rarity. I think that's a, that was a really cool opportunity to translate this. Uh, to the screen. Um, I think it's interesting that Alfred Hitchcock was actually offered the chance to direct it and uh, turned it down. Why do you think he did that? Do you know? You know, I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm not sure if this was just, uh, you know, where this was in his filmography. I mean, uh, the mid fifties, I mean, he was doing the man who knew too much, the wrong man. So he, I mean, he could have just had too many other projects in the works. I mean, he had, those are two films he had come out the same year. So he might've just been too busy. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, let's see. After, uh, we talk about, uh, Patty, uh, McCormick, we got to talk about, uh, who else? Uh, we talked about, we talked about Evelyn Varden, who was fantastic. Yes. Um, as the we the, about, the landlady, yeah, Henry Jones, um, William Hopper, who plays uh, Rhoda's father. Um, just a brief little trivia note, but he is uh, Hedda Hopper's son. Hmm. Hedda Hopper, the uh, the infamous Hedda Hopper, who was uh, um, a, uh, a writer and would uh, was always uh, talking about people in Hollywood, and everybody feared Hedda Hopper. And her uh, and her words, because she could, um, she could turn on you, and that would kind of be the uh, the end of your uh, career. She was like uh, Danny DeVito in uh, L.A. <laughs> Confidential. Oh, I thought you meant just Danny DeVito. <laughs> yeah, Danny DeVito. Yes, don't get on his bad side. <laughs> you know, on the QT, very hush hush. Yes, yes, she was yeah. uh, that sort of person. I mean, she would she named communists. You know, I mean, very gossip columnist sort of thing, but very well known. And uh, I, she just was one of those people you didn't want to cross. Mm-hmm. So I don't know how that played out for uh, for her son and his career. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I can't imagine. <laughs> oh, you're ahead of Harvard's son. <laughs> well, he's not in this film very much. No, he's not. Yeah, he is he's not. not. But who is in this film, uh, you know, also not very much, but the father uh, is played by Paul Fix. Uh, legendary Paul Fix. Man, he's got some credits. Am I right? Yeah, what a face. I mean, he's just one of those faces that uh, you see and go, oh, him. He's been in, well, everything. 335 credits that man has. Yeah. Uh, from... Uh, Goodness, 1925, The Perfect Clown, to his last credit, Quincy M.E. in 1981. Wow. Uh, but he is, he, you're absolutely right. He has an absolute, undeniably uh, familiar face. He is uh, really uh, beautifully uh, uh, portrayed uh, these great Western characters. You know, he was in, he was in the, uh, the Rifleman, you know, and... Uh, uh, he oh, yeah. was in, um, uh, well, the films that he was in, he, he was in El Dorado. He was in, you know, he was in To Kill a Mockingbird. What was he in To Kill a Mockingbird? Um, I'm not sure. That's uh, that's going around our house. Oh, he was the judge. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Wow. I need to watch that again. I, it's it's an assignment on my daughter's uh, reading uh, list this year. So excellent. we will, of course, watch the movie. <laughs> oh, good Anyhow, father. Good father. Uh, so he was he was great, and I think you know his. Uh, he, what we learned from the introduction of the father, back to the movie, uh, what we learned from the introduction of the father is the fact that it turns out his daughter Christine is not his daughter. That Christine was actually the uh, he had adopted her. She was actually the product, uh, the daughter of a 
uh, murderer. And this is where the film starts to feel just a scotch dated. Yeah, all of the uh, all of the exposition about uh, uh, you know the nature versus nurture and yeah. all that sort of stuff. It's uh, is yeah, it's very funny to kind of listen to this as they rattle on about it. Yeah, it is. It is funny. It takes a very black and white approach um, to to this uh, for the premise of the film, uh, and I still think it works. I think it's fine if you just if you watch it and let it wash over you. I think it's fine. Um, it it sets up. Um, what has to end up being believable if you're going to like how the film ultimately ends. You have to kind of buy it uh, because that that sort of cements her struggle, her interpersonal struggle with what she does with her child. And it actually makes her, um, you know, I think we, we see in her, um, it becomes easier for her to let her daughter off and to stay, say things like, put the shoes in the incinerator, wink, wink. She doesn't actually wink. Uh, <laughs> you know, against her better judgment. And that, I believe, is a result of the case that the film is making that she's genetically inclined to make those decisions, to make those well, choices. And do you think that her decision at the end to actually kill her daughter, she finds easier to make that decision because she goes, well, I am the daughter of a killer? Yeah, Absolutely. That's the. I think that's the case the film is making. Yeah, I th- I think that it's like she's a little bit of a bad seed too. She is. Yeah. So. Yeah, she's the bad tree. Yeah. What's interesting about um, this character, um, I'm, uh, Bessie Denker, is the name of the killer in the story, in the movie, play, and book. The character of Bessie Denker, this uh, notorious c- uh, serial killer, she was based on several real. Uh, people and uh, the author kind of transposed some of their story. Uh, Bell Gunnis was one of the women that he kind of used as an example uh, or to kind of pull for his character, Bessie Denker. Also, Jane Toppin, another American serial killer, killed 31 people in 2001. Oh, it's 2001. I was going to say, wow. 1901. I'm just a a few years off. And uh, most interestingly, um, she ended up in the book getting the electric chair. And he based all of that off of the story of Ruth Snyder, who was an American murderer who was executed in the electric chair in Sing Sing. And her character and her... um, her execution, which is, I believe I I talked about this on the double indemnity episode, because this case was the inspiration for the novel double double indemnity. And the photo of her in the electric chair is, I think the possibly the only photo of a person getting killed in the electric chair that exists. That's actually fascinating and fascinating, even more fascinating that it is a woman. Right. Right. I know. And gosh, they're all Americans. (laughs) Yes. Ah, uh, yes. American serial killers. Let's fix that. Harold Rawson cinematography, Oscar nominated for black and white cinematography. I don't know about you, but there was really only one shot in this film that was like, oh, wow, I liked that. And that was the shot when she was going to the incinerator to put the shoes in. The rest of it looked pretty straightforward. I was actually kind of surprised that it uh, was nominated for an Oscar. You know what's funny about it? I remember it as being much more dramatic uh, visually than it was. It was really, it was staged. I mean, it was just a staged uh, presentation to yeah. me. I mean, it was, it was, there was nothing particularly unique about it. I, I didn't even, I mean, you call off the, you call out the incinerator shot. I, I don't, I can't even quite uh, place that shot. Is it from, from downstairs and we're looking up at her? As she's no, coming it's, downstairs? It's, no, it's, she's going to the incinerator out the back door, so she's never going, it's all on the same level as her mom. Her mom's like, just put them in the incinerator, get rid of them, and it's a shot from past the incinerator as, as Rhoda walks toward the camera, and she goes into darkness, and she's just kind of silhouetted as mm-hmm. she puts the shoes in the incinerator, and uh, we see her mom sitting in the back watching her. Okay, I clearly need to go look at that again because I I was with you. I didn't see anything really particularly illuminating about this. Obviously, that is the gift of time. Uh, Maybe it it seemed, or maybe it was up against things that were even more visually banal than this. Well, Somebody Up There Likes Me, uh, the cinematography by Joseph Rutenberg, is the film that won that year for 
for best black and white cinematography. Robert Wise's film. I haven't seen it, so I can't no, speak me neither. to it. Yeah. And then, uh, and then Eileen Heckert, Patty McCormick lost their Oscar to Dorothy Malone for Written on the Wind. And, um, and then Nancy Kelly lost her Oscar for Ingrid, to Ingr- Ingrid Bergman for Anastasia. If I can get that out of my mouth. Uh, how about the music? I thought it was fantastic. Alec North, uh, Alex North. <laughs> My, my ability to speak is clearly <laughs> really? plummeted. But yes, Alex North, a uh, fantastic composer. Great, great horror music here that just had a lot of fun. Um, he really just kind of amped it up and I think did a great job with it. I did too. I thought it was fantastic. I actually really enjoyed it and I made a special note of it about how great it was. And those wonderful horns in the beginning, I mean, I just think they, they it really amps up the intensity. Uh, and so I, I quite enjoyed it. I was on your side. Excellent. Mm -hmm. My last note was, how fun is it to watch a movie like this with an ending (laughs) like this one has, where I'm talking about the actual end, where one, (laughs) you've got the fantastic, very theatrical, uh, you know, the stage bows, essentially, by each actor as they come out and do their curtain call. Yeah. And, And then it's got that great text at the end where it's like, you have just seen a motion picture who, whose, uh, theme does, uh, dares to be startlingly different. May we ask that you do not divulge the unusual climax of this story. Thank you. A gentleman it, would acknowledge that. Yeah, like tip their head. You bet. You bet. This was a right <laughs> good film. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I think that's interesting. What do you think about old, uh, Mervyn Leroy um, in, in terms of his... I mean, we talked... Visually, it doesn't strike you as a real director's camera, but but in terms of... of uh, do you are, are you a fan of uh, Mervyn Leroy's work? Uh, do you... And does this... Do you associate this as being one of his greats? He's got 78 credits. Uh, many of them I've seen. Um, many, of my, many of them I've seen and did not make any real connection to the fact that they were Mervyn Leroy films. Yeah, uh, you know, I have not seen a lot of Mervyn Leroy films. Um, Wizard of Oz, he did some uncredited directing there. Random Harvest, I really enjoy that film. I actually have now seen Mr. Roberts. I know we talked about uh, that one came up when we were doing our uh, uh, 1939 series, I think, because Mm. it had uh, James Cagney in it. Um, I finally saw that. Um, Bad Seed, I haven't seen a lot of his stuff, but I will say it just feels very stagey Hollywood sort of directing. It doesn't speak to me as like a tour director, as the person who's really kind of putting his stamp on it. Um, I mean, I thought it was fine listening to uh, people talk about it. It sounded like his goal was to take the show and basically direct this so it felt like the show on film. And I think I think he succeeded, but I just don't think there's any stamp on it that says this is a Mervyn Leroy film. Yeah, I I don't think so really either. Maybe the uh, you know I I need to go back and watch some of these other films. You know, little little Caesar. Um, you know, like you said, Mister Roberts. Um, he credits Cecil B. DeMille as being the guy who taught him, and and I mean literally taught him. They worked together, um, uh, taught him the the techniques required to make his own films. Um, I, I don't think they were really on display in, necessarily in this uh, in this film. Those techniques, no. I don't but it was so. a right good film all the same. Yeah, I I agree. All right, uh, we ready to talk about numbers? Let's yeah, let's hit some numbers. All right, how did it do this? This film, um, it from what I found, I found just kind of rough estimates. It cost about a million to make. Um, so you know, not too much money. Uh, it's about eight million in today's dollars, and then in uh, uh, it ended up making in the box office. Let me find that here. It ended up making about four point one million dollars, which is about thirty five million. So you know, it considering um, the horror vibe and everything, it did pretty well for itself. It made about two hundred and six thousand per finished minute adjusted. All right, not bad. No, not too bad. Not bad. I mean, you know, for a movie that really celebrates school bullies, <laughs> am I right? Like, this is the worst school bully ever because she'll actually kill you. Like, right. that's what's so horrible about this. If you were ever bullied, don't watch this movie. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, because you'll think every bully experience, you just made it out by the skin of your teeth exactly. from then on out. I know. 
<laughs> uh, poor, I, poor little Claude Daigle. Poor Claude Daigle. He, because his parents probably said, you stand up to that bully. And then she beat him with her tap shoes. <laughs> Until he drowned. Until he drowned. <laughs> Awful. Uh, the best uh, the best one was, um, I, I think, one of the best little murder, uh, you know, s- sequences in the film is when she's, she, she, her mother is saying, you know, what happened to old Miss What's-Her-Name, you know, is what you said true? Um, yes, there was a patch of ice at the top of the stairs, and I slipped, and I fell into her, and she fell down the stairs and broke her neck, and that's, and that's what happened. And her mom says, is that all? And she nods her head, no, I fell on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Well, and the bit at the very end when she says how um, uh, Mrs. Breedlove said that she'll give her her lovebirds when she dies. And she's like, how long How long do lovebirds live? And she's like, how long is she going to live? And then she's, she's like, oh, she, well, we'll talk about it more tomorrow. She promised to take me sunbathing. We're going to be up on the roof where no one can see us. <laughs> oh, oh, so good. It's just great. All right. I think we should probably rank it. Let's do it. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel, and you should sign up if you haven't yet, and uh, then you should friend us. Definitely friend us, and let's see uh, how your movies and our movies line up. Let's do it. All right, The Bad Seed, or Kind Hearts and Coronets. Very interesting uh, matchup of (laughs) somebody deciding to kill off everybody who uh, (laughs) gets in their way. (laughs) <laughs> this is actually a really good flick chart matchup. I'm going to go with the bad seed on this one. I really am torn. I kind of want to go with Kind Hearts and Coronets, actually. Hmm. Yeah, I think I am Kind Hearts and Coronets. You, how much? Like really, really Kind Hearts and Coronets? No, I'm, I'm, I'm like sixty forty, so mm. I'm pretty easy to sway. So. I, you know, I for me, I just think, uh, and and this is nothing to do with the great Sir Alec Guinness. I had a, uh, I had more fun watching the Bad Seed. I just, I because the the Kind Hearts and Cornets is great, and all the characters are great, and and I really enjoy uh, watching that film. Uh, but it it's. It's a little bit of a roller coaster, and I think my consistent experience of just sort of being kind of edge of your seat, tortured by watching this little girl get away with everything uh, until she's blown up by lightning. Blown up by lightning, Andy. <laughs> uh, well, you get a photographer blown up in his uh, in his lab. Well, you know, you do have a point. Uh, no, I'll go with the bad seed. That's right. fine. You know, the bad seed is is come become quite the like a uh, gay uh cult classic apparently do tell <laughs> <laughs> how, I, however did you discover this I, they talk about it on the commentary that it's uh you know it's like you know like the castro theater and stuff they'll show this and it's like one of those movies where everybody knows the lines and they're all quoting it and doing all the parts and everything and it's hysterical and it's like guys in drag yes doing it. it's- you can find those <laughs> are also staged on youtube so you can find them and they're wonderful when so when the when the gay Mrs. Daigle stumbles on stage, is it, it's a it's a riot. The theater <laughs> goes into a riot of applause. It's great. That is so fun. That should get the vote for the first the first nod anyway. No matter what the- movie it goes up against. So I'm glad <laughs> I'm glad we gave it to the bad seed. All right, the bad seed or sleepless in Seattle. I defer to you, sir. I, I, I mean, Sleepless in Seattle. I, I mean, I think it is just a stronger film and one that I would probably watch first, as much as I did enjoy the Bad Seed. Yeah. Uh, okay. The Bad Seed or Sunshine? We haven't seen that one pop up in a while. I'm definitely Sunshine. I think you know how I feel about that movie. Yeah, I, I always stumble on that third act, but at the same time, it's. Uh, Pretty awesome movie. The Bad Seed, I know where you're going with this one, or Thank You for Smoking. (laughs) Yes. Yes, Yes. you're welcome. Thank you for smoking. (laughs) The Bad Seed or Chronicle? Oh, Chronicle, yeah. Yeah, Chronicle. The Bad Seed or Mad Max? The first one. The first one. Mad Max. Toe cutter. All right, I'll go Mad Max here too. 
I, I almost want to go the bad seed, but I think I'll go. I think I'll go Mad Max. I could probably be swayed. I'm not going to sway you. All right. The bad seed or hot fuzz. <laughs> I'm hot fuzz. I'll, I'm hot fuzz. <laughs> Oh, uh, the bad seed or oh brother, where art thou? Oh brother, where art thou? Yeah, well, it came out of the gate strong, and then it uh, didn't fare so well. One oh three out of two oh five. So you know, it's, it's right in the still, middle. Yeah, right in the middle. Not too bad. I enjoyed this film, and I think it was a great, great way to kick off our inaugural horrible children series <laughs> this year. Do you agree? Yes, it was a it was a real treat. I'm glad to have seen this one. Um, I did not show my children. There may be a day down the line where I feel ready to show my children, but I wasn't quite ready this go around. I need to call my mother because she's the one who introduced me to this, and now I need That's to remind right. her that she made me watch this, uh, and then I then I want her to watch Mother. <laughs> oh yes, that'll be a nice little mother yeah. son yeah. <laughs> pairing yeah. together. Andy. Let's fill in our uh, letterbox holes. Where do you put this one? That's a good question. I think that this is when I would do three and a half. That's exactly what I was thinking. God, man. It's like we're reading each other's minds. All right. Where do we go from here? So we're going to be jumping four years forward to 1960, and we're going to watch the original Village of the Damned. I have not seen this. And I have seen this one, and I enjoy it quite a bit. All right. This and the sequel um, are both are both very fun films, so it'll be fun to watch this one. I may actually watch both because the DVD that uh, came from Netflix actually has both on the discs. So no I might kidding. Just, yeah, I might uh, I might give them both a watch. The first and the sequel, not the remake. The, right, the sequel, yeah. Children of the Damned. Okay. Village of the Damned. That's the one I should watch. Yes. I don't yes. want to watch any. I don't want to mess up. Right. Don't want to do that. All right. Uh, and and has Village of the Damned ever been uh, uh, showcased in the Castro Theater? <laughs> Is that one that's has. ever been done? I don't know. But Live I, and I, in I, drag. I kind of doubt it has the same, <laughs> same following. <laughs> well, that gives us something to work on for next week. Yes, indeed. Right. Until then, I've got to go to bed. All right. I've got a pair of uh, dance shoes at my daughter's. i got to go throw the incinerator. Uh, I'm coming in at two stars from Jim Long, and he says, avert your ears. Mm. Would not have expected that from the bad seed. Ears is not a thing I was concerned about, but it turns out, he says, despite the Oscar nominations and Golden Globe wins, the bad seed is not aged all that well. It was adapted from a Broadway play, taken from a best-selling novel that remains largely stage-bound with lots of expository material left to reveal plot and character. The acting honors are well-deserved, especially young Patty McCormick as the murderous brat. But Nancy Kelly's raspy whine is hard to take, inevitably reaching a near howl as the story unfolds. Just when I was ready to hit the stop button, the grieving drunken mom played marvelously by marvelously with a tinge of humor by Eileen Heckart shows up twice, thank goodness. Does anyone else see a potential TV sitcom here? <laughs> <laughs> Nice. I think he's. I think he's giving two stars. Uh, it, that's a a really critical two stars. If 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 those two stars are based on Nancy Kelly alone, right? It is. It's pretty hard on. There's it. There's a lot of people who are pretty hard on Nancy Kelly and the theatrics of the film, which eh, yeah, you know, I guess it's one of those things we talked about. Well, this yeah. is a one star from Megan Rhodes, who says only the name is scary. We laughed. <laughs> <laughs> we laughed through the whole movie, and I get scared easily. If you want a horror film, this is not it. Yeah, well, well, you know what? Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, they're not really a horror band either, but uh, maybe it, <laughs> no, they, they, they might not. sound scary, though. I don't know. <laughs> oh, Amazon. Amazon. <laughs>
It is hard to believe we have been having in-depth conversations about movies since 2011. You are telling me. Producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. Season 5 had some great adaptations, like our Meryl Streep Oscar-nominated performances series. We covered adaptations like Kramer vs. Kramer, Sophie's Choice, and The French Lieutenant's Woman. It's a real Sophie's Choice between those books. <laughs> you see what I, <laughs> see what I did there? Uh, yeah. Uh, and I don't think it's quite at the level of a real Sophie's Choice. We also did Snowpiercer for our Bong Joon-ho series, adapted from the French graphic novel Le Transpersonnage. Man, I love that movie. We had our two-part 1939 series that included adaptations like Gone with the Wind, Ninochka, The Women, and The Hound of the Baskervilles. A number of those 1939 movies, like Goodbye Mr. Chips, also tied into our recent 1940 Academy Award Best Picture nominee series. Our naughty children horror series had creepy adaptations like The Bad Seed, Village of the Damned, The Innocents, and Children of the Corn. For our Hayao Miyazaki series, we talked about his take on Lupin III with the Castle of Cagliostro, plus his own The Wind Rises. Some great listener choice picks, too. Viridiana and The Great Escape. And for our David Mamet Wright's series, The Verdict, The Untouchables, and Glengarry Glen Ross. Plus, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang from our Shane Black series adapted from Brett Halliday's novel, Bodies Are Where You Find Them. Dive into the sources for all of these at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book you buy helps support the show. Check out thenextreel.com slash originals today and find your next read. <laughs>